This conference will now be recorded. A very good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this industry e-meet. Um, today we have Aishwarya S. Kuti. Um, she's a NIFT Bangalore graduate and a multidisciplinary designer with experience both nationally and internationally. She has worked in different business formats to understand how design plays a part in organizations. Interested in creating a circular economy model for textile waste and creating impact for artisan and craft communities. I welcome Aishwarya for this uh, afternoon industry e-meet and uh, Aishwarya, over to you. Yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Umesh. Um, I'm just going to share uh, camera as I well. Uh, I think uh, for most of the students, uh, from DP, this must be the first time that they're seeing me as well. Um, yes. So yeah, it's nice to be here. Uh, it's nice to sort of just uh, take everybody through a little bit uh, about uh, what my process is and what my brand is as well. Yes. Um, so yeah, I think maybe to start off with how I got introduced to fashion design was very, uh, it was extremely random, honestly, again, um, Six, I, even in my sixth and seventh grade, I was still under the impression that I would go down uh, a, a conventional route of looking at engineering or uh, medicine. Uh, but then, yeah, I think I've always enjoyed art as a kid. I've always enjoyed uh, making things. So I think that sort of took importance once I sort of um, explored more when I, you know, got further down my teens. So um, I think, yeah, somewhere around seventh, eighth grade was when I decided that, okay, you know what, maybe I can try for something um, along a creative uh, route uh, as a career. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, uh, I applied for the NIFT entrance uh, exam and I got through um, and I selected Bangalore as my base. Uh, so that's where I ended up um, after, uh, after college. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, just to speak a little bit about what uh, college was like, um, especially fashion design and fashion and design college. The first year is essentially a foundation program where they introduce you to uh, a lot of different types of techniques and uh, a lot of different um, avenues of design. So it's not just about uh, fashion design in the first year. The first year you get to explore with a lot of different materials. I've even done uh, welding. Uh, which is something I didn't expect to be doing uh, in fashion school. Uh, there was um, obviously there was a lot of uh, sculpting and um, different types of art uh, generation that had to be done. Um, it was just uh, a way to uh, introduce you to different areas of design, different areas of fashion, uh, which gives you that flexibility as you uh, move forward into the rest, uh, into the remaining uh, years of the course. So the first year, again, we entered in detail into fashion design. Um, we had modules and, um, you know, different assignments and projects to do in each module. Um, we had a lot of submissions, a lot of practical work that had to be done. It was a huge change going from uh, an exam scenario where you had to study like months before and, uh, you know, sort of put everything from your brain into one sheet at one point of time. This was, uh, the whole process was spread over a very long period of time. So each project would take us maybe uh, two or three months to do. And uh, there would be a lot of these bigger projects. There would be a lot of smaller projects. So you also learned a lot about time management at the same time. Uh, how do you sort of um, divide time between all of this? Uh, so yeah, that was, 
pretty much four years that happened. Um, also, at the end of four years, this is actually all the way back in 2012, um, in fashion school, they would let you have a final collection that you had to do, uh, a final design collection that you, from scratch, you start with the inspiration, uh, with the um, sourcing of material, with the pattern making, with the sewing, to the photography, everything that you had to get done uh, yourself. So if I could share a little bit about that, I'm going to share some images. Yeah, please. Yeah. I hope my screen's visible. Is there a illustrative sketch with some photos? Not it. I think it will okay. take uh, little yeah. time. Oh, yes, we can see. Yes. Yeah, OK, all right, great. So this was uh, the work that I'd done back in my fourth fourth year of college. So it's just, uh, I hope it's helpful to a lot of people who are seeing it maybe to have an idea of how it works. So this is a very rough uh, generation. I don't really have a lot of the work with me right now. Um, so yeah, I mean, we had to pick a theme uh, or an inspiration. For me, it was a very, um, you know, European history, prehistoric time uh, inspiration, sorry, pre, uh, like 1800s, 1900s inspiration that I took. And uh, one of my hobbies is definitely reading. I really like to read a lot. Um, so, and one of my favorite books at that point of time was uh, Pride and Prejudice. So that's the inspiration that I took from those and uh, the characters that I took inspiration from. So again, each of the garments was sort of representative of the character of their uh, personality as a whole. So that's what you would see in a lot of the sketches versus the garments that were done. So just quickly going to take you through the presentation. So again, this is one of the first garments uh, that I had done. Um, like you can see, we had models. It was done in a professional situation where you actually had this whole feeling that yes you're a designer you're showcasing your work to uh, industry experts and uh, you know a lot of faculties and there used to be external juries uh, that would attend this so it was a really interesting um, process again a couple of the uh, this was the second design that i had done so you can see uh, there's a lot of inspiration there's a lot of uh, inspiration from um, vintage uh, uh, vintage inspiration you could say uh, a lot of the fabrics i had treated uh, with a lot of different techniques there was a lot of dyeing techniques that i had experimented with um, a lot of layers that i experimented with yeah so this was again the third look um, that i tried out and uh, then finally we went on to actually there's a funny story behind this garment so um, and this is quite this is something that happens quite often um, you know in a runway show so uh, i think maybe like some some one one minute or like two minutes before the show began the zip of this garment ripped apart it just came came off so in the last minute i had to sew her into the garment and i told her listen please keep your arms really close to your body so it's something that happens quite often and i'm really glad i got to experience it although at that moment it felt like i was having a heart attack almost um and yeah this was the final garment uh Yeah, so that's that's a little that's the whole show. Um, okay, yeah. So that was uh, college. After which, essentially, um, I worked uh, in a couple of different organizations at different capacities. Uh, I didn't really work in um, a fashion or apparel situation. That was the most interesting part to me. Uh, I actually worked in visual merchandising, in retail, in merchandising. Uh, there were a whole, whole lot of different areas that I wanted to explore. Uh, I think primarily after graduating from college, my whole aim was try as many um, 
avenues of design that I hadn't explored possibly in college. I didn't particularly enjoy stitching and uh, pattern making at that point of time. Uh, but then, yeah, right now I do. Um, so yeah, so after that, I worked for a couple of years, um, both um, nationally in Bangalore and internationally as well. And after which I came to the realization that um, it was probably time that I sort of undertake something of my own. Um, so me and another partner of mine who I'd met through one of my jobs, we sort of came together to start a brand of our own, uh, the brand known as Pomo Grenade right now. So I, I would like to take you all through a little bit about the brand as well, what it stands for, and maybe just introduce you to a concept that um, was fairly new to the world, um, you know, until like a couple of years ago. So um, yeah, a little bit about Pomo Grenade. Um, we are essentially an ethical fashion brand based in Bangalore, and um, we work with a lot of natural fabrics, uh, we work on making a lot of uh, classic designs, designs that you can sort of wear from, uh, you know, uh, morning to evening that you can sort of transfer from work to dinner uh, or just something that is really comfortable to wear uh, to work and otherwise, because that was something that we realized in the market at that point of time when we started in 2016 was something, there was a bit of a gap over there. There was either really stuffy menswear inspired looks for women or um, Indian kurtas and you know just sort of basic styles out there. Uh, I'm sure a lot of you would have heard of maybe ethical fashion, sustainable fashion but maybe there's a question of what that is essentially so I would hope to maybe take you through that to help you understand what um, ethical and sustainable fashion is hopefully. All right, so when we started with Pomo Grenade, the need was essentially to have accessible, comfortable clothing that was work appropriate and can, you know, translate from uh, work to evening wear. I think that's something that I just uh, spoke about a little bit. And we did a little bit of research. So me and my partner, uh, Madhu, we did a little bit of research before starting the brand to see where the gap was in the market. What uh, as a brand, what could we cater to and who do we cater to? To what customer do we uh, approach? That's essentially when we came across this uh, warning sign, essentially, that was fast fashion. So I'm sure a lot of you know of a lot of brands that create a huge quantity of clothing and have sales pretty much every other uh, week, weekend, uh, you know, and clothing that are really cheap, that probably even start at like, a um, hundred rupees and it, it sort of um, came about you know from this whole concept of uh, use and throw so it's something that you wear probably once or twice and then you just don't use it um, again you know ever well, so that's recorded. something something that we realized was a huge problem uh, for a lot of reasons one us fashion is actually a huge contributor to um, Pollution. This we're going to wait for the noise to die down. Yeah. So we realized that fast fashion was actually a huge contributor to um, uh, pollution, right? So again, uh, this whole use and throw method that I was talking about, where you buy something which is really cheap, you wear it, and then after a couple of a uh, couple of wears, you just sort of you know, throw it into the garbage, it ends up in landfills like this. It ends up, uh, you know, with tons of tons of clothing that sort of come and get left in landfills. Uh, textile waste is one of the largest, uh, you know, contributors after, um, I think, the oil industry and um, animal uh, husbandry. So that's something that we found in our research. So we thought about how could we approach this situation, right? So we realized that the reason people use and throw uh, garments as such was because there would be fit issues, uh, there would be quality issues, something that you wear loses shape or tears after a couple of times, something that is not really sustainable. Um, 
again i'm not sure if a lot of you know this but every time you wash a pair a garment there's a lot of waste that is generated from that like micro particles that is generated from that and uh, that all essentially ends up in your water in uh, again in land it goes under the ground so yeah just uh, these are scary statistics but it's just it's not to scare you all but it's just uh, even when we first saw it it was really strange to us that clothing really could be the most polluting environment so that was something uh, we also took some time to sort of think in um, and then we started with a whole range of um, apparel that was um, natural um, caught by made with cotton and again a lot of different types of natural fibers so this was the initial range that we sort of experimented with so to start off with we started off with a really small range uh, probably 10 pieces uh, with a couple of sizes in each uh, we wanted to again test the market see how people responded to the brand and they responded really well they quite enjoyed um, you know the idea of really fun looking uh, garments and uh, there's a lot to it which we'll get into in a bit so again some of the research that we did we based on uh, you know where is this waste getting generated from and we uh, noticed that yes after after you know the garment is worn and you know used that's where one generation one sort of waste is generated another one is generated in the production stage itself where uh, while while the you know the garment is being manufactured itself there's almost 10 to 30 percent of the fabric that is uh, you know thrown away and that is perfectly usable fabrics that are actually uh, well made that are really beautiful uh, crafted fabric right so that is an area that we realized that we could target to so uh, yeah so then we asked the question we asked ourselves the question of uh, what is the value of waste right how can we sort of convert this into something that could add value to a customer uh, we came up with a bunch of, uh, since then, actually, we've come up with a bunch of uh, garments and pieces that um, are, uh, you know, unique in a sense. Uh, they are quite, um, one. Of, they're all one of a kind. So if you see the different types of fabric that we've used, this range that we had developed was a range of uh, three size kimonos. One size fits all kimonos for both men and women. And these were all fabrics that, we had collected from uh, a group of the, a cluster of uh, from Assam. The, they have a tribe over there known as the Bodo tribe. So this is all fabric that they weave. These are all cut pieces from some export clients that we knew. Again, if you see, they're so intricate, they're so beautiful and colorful, but they were all cut pieces. So that's when we sort of thought about creating these one-off pieces from just production waste. Um, again, we get a lot of different types of fabrics that we work with. So the, the first three images that you see on top, they're all made from a fabric known as lotus silk. They're made from uh, the stem of the lotus flower. It's a quite, uh, you know, it's a manual process. It's extremely time consuming, but the fabric at the end of the day that you get is really soft, very similar to um, silk almost. Uh, but um, it's very easy to use as well. And yeah, you can see some of the upcycled pieces that we've created from bamboo fabric as well, uh, and from some um, airy silk, uh, some wool. Again, all of these are production waste uh, fabrics that we had collected. None of them were actually purchased as a whole roll. Uh, the next question we sort of thought about was how do we create uh, garments that other than, you know, fit issues and uh, quality issues, how do we ensure that a garment uh, stays with a customer for a longer period of time? How do we ensure that someone can use them? Um, so I'm, I'm assuming or this was again based on a research that we had done was customers tend to get bored of garments that they have you know they have a little bit of silos that they see the same piece again and again how do you sort of uh, approach that 
So that was something that we took on as a challenge. How do you make the garment? Um, how do you make the garment seem more interesting to the person? How do you, um, you know, approach fit issues? Uh, human bodies, again, as we all know, could expand, could shrink. So how do you make sure that this person doesn't throw away the garment even if they grow out of the of the garment? So that's why we approached uh, a couple of our uh, collections. You can see are uh, adaptable, where you can uh, just by using simple uh, you know extra buttons at the back it can be adjusted so you can be made bigger or smaller to fit you uh, and uh, the range that you saw the, the, the design that you see at the bottom we call a three-way jacket because you can wear it three ways uh, you could wear it as a dress with this in front or you can turn it around wear it with this as the front as well or wear it as a jacket so it it sort of makes it um, interesting for the customer as well they get to style it as they sort of would like to they get to um, experiment with that one piece and out of that one piece they get three pieces almost so that sort of makes sure that they don't throw away the garment almost immediately but they hold on to it they experiment with it they try different things they, uh, the garment keeps them interested essentially and again, we've done a couple of ranges. We've experimented with unisex styles. So garments or t-shirts, uh, essentially, that can be worn by both men and women at the same time. Um, yeah, so uh, again, uh, we had a lot of these trims that uh, you know we sourced from, again, our network partners uh, that we realized we could sort of use in this manner. Also, another thing about ethical fashion, sustainable fashion that everyone faces is that um, they find that the price point is too high. Uh, and we've sort of been in a space where we try to bridge that gap between uh, fast fashion and, you know, ethical fashion that is quite expensive. So uh, that's another area that we target as well. Um, again, I think another area that is really important for designers to focus on along with uh, you know branding or talking about your brand communication is packaging uh, how do you sort of uh, you know because the packaging is essentially the first impression that your product has uh, on a on a consumer so and again we wanted that also to be uh, you know really uh, sustainable ethical and zero waste as well so how we did that was, again, we partnered up with a group of women in Bangalore who made paper bags, simple paper bags, uh, you know, really thick paper bags. And we just used that um, as our packaging. And also we tied up with another company that, that does beautiful block printing on paper again. And we use that as a gift wrapping. Um, so yeah, that's another area that we focused on was making sure that our packaging was sustainable as well. And also another area that we focused on was to make sure that all our products were made in a very fair and transparent process. So we work with a wonderful team. It's a very small team uh, of women um, based in Bangalore again. Uh, and, uh, you know, it's, it's a really wonderful organization that um, provides them with fair wages. They provide them uh, education even. Uh, so they, give, they have English classes. They have computer classes that they undergo. Uh, a lot of uh, just sort of life survival skills in a way. Uh, so that's another conscious decision that we made uh, while manufacturing our garments as well. All right, so that's a little bit about Pomo Grenade and what I do currently. Um, so yeah, that's, that's about it. All right, Aishwarya, that was uh, quite interesting to know about your brand and um, um, how you are approaching the, uh, the fashion design. And uh, that's very interesting. Now, I would like to know if uh, you also do custom designs for the customers? So um, currently, like I said, how we work is we work with the fabric that we have available to us. So we don't know at any point of time what the fabric could be. 
uh, we don't know uh, how much of it we'll get at any point of time so at this point of time we don't really do custom orders uh, but that and also because of uh, you know gap in our manufacturing so at, with any manufacturing unit they will have minimum orders uh, that need to be done so per design they'll have a uh, hundred pieces or 250 pieces or it depends from unit to unit so at this point of time we don't do customized designs um, yeah for any of our customers okay okay so do you cater to men's fashion as well so uh, again if you saw the last slide with the t-shirts right now we are catering to unisex um, uh, design Okay. we have we have we were actually in the process of uh, you know designing and developing our first menswear range uh, when covid hit unfortunately okay all right yeah. okay all right. uh, another so, thing that we have consciously sorry um, consciously look at is this whole adaptable feature that is also something that we want to bring into menswear because again uh, menswear we realize is all about fit it's all about uh, fabric. So we realized that uh, that is again something that we need to bring to, uh, you know, menswear as well, which is um, a little less catered to field uh, as compared to women's wear. Okay. All right. So, um, all right. So uh, I would like to ask the attendees if they have any specific questions that you would like to ask for Aishwarya, you can uh, please use the chat window and uh, ask your questions. Okay. Um, so, meanwhile, the questions, Aishwarya, can you let us know how you are utilizing your time during the lockdown? Yeah. So, um, as a business, we have not been focusing on uh, pushing our products out because currently, um, yeah, definitely you're seeing a you know a downfall in sales and I'm just muting everybody. Yeah, Aishwarya. Yeah. Hold on, I'll unmute you. Yeah, I'm just yeah, can you... uh, so definitely yeah, yeah. We have uh, definitely seen uh, business has been affected as has all businesses, uh, you know, throughout the world, essentially. Um, so what we've been focusing on right now is uh, trying to engage the customer primarily through our channels, such as uh, social media by, uh, you know, sort of uh, mailer or emailers. Uh, we're trying mm -hmm. to keep them uh, interested, engaged. We're trying to just send out a little positive message with everything we do. Uh, we hmm. do a lot of small, uh, you know, sort of assignments where you, we talk to them about uh, mending. So again, uh, quite simply, just I'm sure a lot of us have clothing, uh, you know, in our wardrobes that just need a simple button change or has a small hole that can be fixed with really simple technique. So we try to approach, uh, you know, our customers with solutions to that. And also we, you know, sort of let them experiment with, uh, we did this whole session on natural dyeing where we use, uh, you know, food scraps that you have at home, like onions and uh, beetroot, and you can use that to dye your garments at home itself. So that was another session that we did as well uh, through oh, our Instagram. So yeah. are these like, um, like a paid events or they are like uh, YouTube events or how do you organize them and if somebody so, wants to join how do they do yeah so these are all pre-recorded events that we just upload onto our instagram stories so again okay. it, this, this period is also like an experimental time for me and my partner at the same time so uh, we try a lot of these things ourselves which is something that we do at a personal level and then we post that on the uh, on the you know the company page as well Okay. Uh, yeah, and also, you know, sort of attending a lot of webinars. Um, I think the best part about COVID is that everybody's moved online and everything now is accessible um, and right. available to everybody. So we, I think uh, almost every other day I try to attend at least one webinar. Uh, and also we've been able to connect with a lot of our uh, network partners online uh, much more often than we did before, uh, you know. Okay. The whole right. So, uh, what are channels do you sell your uh, products? Yeah. So, our 
Prime channel is still our website. Uh, we are definitely seeing a huge shift towards an online or e-commerce retail uh, platform. Uh, primarily, I would have to say 70% is all online. Um, uh -huh. So that would be our website. We also ship internationally because that is a huge market that we see um, at the international market who is much more aware of what ethical fashion is. They, uh, they, have, a, they have more... Uh, awareness that we see of and also our price point works really well for an international market so uh, we have uh, other channels that cater to an international market we are also on a lot of multi-brand outlets uh, that are based in uh, india as well uh, along with that previous to this we used to do a lot of pop-ups uh, a lot of events where we used to showcase our products and uh, again we had a lot of offline retail spaces or like uh, we had brands uh, again based in uh, Bangalore that would uh, display our products uh, for us and uh, you know they would sell our products for us. These were a couple okay. of different business models that we had approached. Okay. okay. So um... Because of this lockdown, it has actually impacted many industries, right? So, uh, Richa wants to know what would be the future of fashion industry after the lag, uh, lockdown? Uh, like any huge changes that have been expected? Yeah, uh, I think personally what change I'm seeing is everyone is going to go local, right? So, again, starting from even if like the lockdown, uh, you know, is... Uh, taken off uh, for anything you're going to probably go uh, down the street to your local tailor possibly with fabric that you have to get something made or uh, that's one possibility where everything is going to shift to a crafts and handmade model so that's one way that it could go uh, and primarily everything else is going to shift online so i think another survey that we had done and we, we uh, sort of analyzed recently was that uh, after the lockdown, 75% of people are more uh, happy to move to an online or an e-commerce model as opposed to uh, visiting physical stores. So again, that could be a, a quick sort of analysis, uh, you know, in the current scenario. But yeah, definitely, I think everything is going to go, uh, you know, to an online platform as well as along a handmade uh, route. Okay. <clears throat> Um, so I'm just reading through some of the questions. So sure. Vashita Prakash is asking, from where do you source the fabric? Yeah. So I think initially when we started, our biggest concern was making sure that we uh, source natural fabric that we know uh, has been made properly with, without uh, any additives or as few additives as possible. So our first few, uh, you know, ranges, we again went to a government um, organization, which is the Khadi Emporium in Bangalore itself. And that's where we uh, got our initial range of fabrics from. Uh, we still uh, use them as our uh, supply chain, um, although right now we also have a lot of other supply chains as well. Uh, our business model is based on collaboration. So we don't really own a lot of the... Uh, it, the equipments or uh, you know any of the processes are not owned by us but we always outsource because we feel that's a way that we can generate a lot more income for the people that we work with uh, we work with a lot of our network partners uh, a lot of uh, ngos a lot of uh, organizations that work in crafts and handicrafts um, again so what we have noticed is even over there, there's a lot of waste that's generated, even in the handmade space. You may think that handmade takes a lot of time. It's, it's you know, a very time consuming process. But uh, what happens is when these people work on maybe export orders or even uh, for, uh, you know, bulk orders, if there's any sort of weaving defect or color defect that happens, it could be a very minute one, but the whole lot gets rejected. And then uh, they probably don't get paid. They don't have use for that fabric. It's just they're collecting dust. So that's where we come in. We come in as a solution to their problem, to these, uh, you know, to the problem of these clusters or 
uh, these uh, artisans that uh, need that little, you know, sort of input. Right. Anna, yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, Kushi Pahade is asking, what, according to you, is a favorite part of being a fashion designer? Okay. Um. Definitely, I think I can't really pick any one part of it. Yes, st starting from sourcing for fabric, which is uh, a really hands-on process where you have to go to different places and uh, you can't really, uh, you have to touch and feel the garment to understand, uh, you know, how it, how it falls, how it deals with, uh, you know, uh, different silhouettes starting from sourcing then when you look for, look at the ideation process which is also really it can take really long because you're looking at multiple iterations of even it could be the same product but you're trying out different versions of it um, and maybe i guess sampling could take a little bit uh, of a center stage because i actually love seeing the products come to life that's essentially where it comes to life which is the sampling process and yes yeah, sampling is definitely the most uh, time consuming of all of them it takes us easily i think two to three months we start wow. designing the collection six months before but sampling takes a good two to three months of that uh because yeah i think manufacturing takes uh, half of that but then the other half we also test the product out to see if uh, it is going to you know stand uh, the test of time uh, we uh, even sort of uh, show our products to a few of our uh, network partners. It could be friends, family. We get their input. We ask them, do you like this? What is it that you don't like? So that hmm. is a couple of processes that we undertake uh, in the sampling stage. And production is quite um, quick as compared to sampling because you know what needs to get done. It's just about, uh, you know, sort of putting the pieces together. Um, and then obviously there's the whole part of presenting your product to the world. So um, obviously the photo shoots and, uh, you know, the sort of language that your product has uh, is something also that uh, once it's a set process, then it becomes easy to translate. Yeah, but I guess maybe sampling would have to be my favorite part of, um, you know, okay. the whole process. All right. So Aditi is asking uh, if you could give some tips on becoming a successful designer. So okay. for the aspirants, basically, let us, let us uh, break this down. Okay, so one is number one, of course, they have to get into a good design school. So when I'm looking at the various questions that I'm seeing, yeah. it can be, the questions can be divided into two parts. One is how do you get into a good design school? That is number one. What qualities, aptitudes, or what one needs to do to achieve that. And then the next step is once you come out of the design school, how do you establish yourself and how do you become a successful fashion designer? Okay, great. So the first part of the question was how do you get into a good uh, design school? school. In uh, this case, let us say in NIFT. Okay, yeah. So I think uh, the key point to focus on is to make sure that you have a distinct style or distinct way of presenting your ideas so it could be again it doesn't have to be only your sketching skills so because that is only a medium of translating your ideas uh, there are multiple mediums for you to translate your ideas so it's just about identifying what that style is right so again um, some of them like i said could be really good at sketching maybe that's your strength so that's the way forward that's something that you focus on something that you strengthen um you know and present that well um, maybe someone's good at making things so that's something that you could focus on making sure that you make a lot of the products that you envision in your head possibly uh, maybe someone's really good at photography so maybe that's something you could focus on so again basically just focusing on your strengths developing that style for yourself uh, or just making yourself stand out with that skill that you have is something that uh, would let would take you into a good design school really uh, you know easily um, but yeah and i think um, i would also before before i go to the second question of what you can do after design school i would like to suggest what you can do in design school so this is something 
uh, that I didn't get a lot of chance to do. I wish someone had told me before um, when I was in school. And right now, there's a whole lot of opportunity out there with technology and you know smaller companies that are smaller, more niche companies that are coming up. My suggestion would be that every time you have a summer break or a winter break, see if you can get an internship or a project from uh, any brand or any designer, even if it is, uh, you know, a, a couple of days maybe. But it's something that will open you up to a whole different level of uh, information that probably you wouldn't get from um, an environment, an educational environment, but you may get from an industry environment. So that would be my biggest suggestion to um, any student in a design school. And again, when you get out of uh, design school, um, probably the same thing, work on your portfolio essentially maybe um, a good uh, suggestion I got from a potential employer was um, instead of having so many projects, uh, maybe I think back in the day I had close to 10 to 12 projects that I showcased in my portfolio. A better thing would be to sort of take maybe three or four of your projects and do an in-depth study of those three or four projects. So something that you uh, show that you have done a whole lot of work uh, along one single line um, and something that you're focused on uh, presenting as your work. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah, so uh, you had mentioned earlier about um, dyeing clothes with beetroot, right? So Kavita yeah. had a question. So how do you ensure that um, the color would not leave after washing the fabric? Yeah, so uh, natural dyeing, as is uh, what it is known as, is a very, uh, it's something that uh, it, it, you can't really ensure that, you know, the color stays for long. Uh, mm -hmm. And again, this is a, this is a very DIY process that we had done, right? So this is again for someone. Um, we're just trying to um, present an idea that could lead to um, lead to the life of this garment extending, essentially. So there are a lot of um, you know companies that actually do uh, focus on um, natural dyeing as a process. So that's where I've gotten half the information from, but this was actually a more of a DIY situation. But yeah, there are lots of methods that you can make the color last longer, although the beauty of natural dyeing is seeing a completely different color or a different formation every time you wash the garment or even the way that it reacts with air is very interesting. When you think about it, beetroot actually reacts with air to oxidize and it gives you a completely different color uh, than when you just dye it, when it's freshly dyed. So that's a very interesting process by itself. Okay, all right. So Sejal is asking, what keeps you inspired when you are stuck in boredom? Okay, um, if, if it's referring to right now, possibly you could see there's a little uh, thing that's happening at the back. So that's just something, uh, I. it's a work in progress almost. It's just something, again, if I don't, um, uh, you know, feel creatively inclined. I just maybe take a paintbrush or I take, uh, you know, my sketchbook out. I just uh, randomly doodle a little bit uh, or I read uh, because I do enjoy reading. So I do that. Or, yeah, I always uh, even just go having a conversation helps sometimes. So if you have friends or, uh, in my case, colleagues who are, you know, sort of similarly inclined, just having a conversation with them sometimes just sparks. A little bit of uh, interest you could say or just gives you that little inspiration that is needed yeah so uh, that's just a couple of things that I personally do to sort of um, again yeah I always enjoy working with fabric so even with whatever I always have a lot of waste fabric at home from the job so I just experiment with different types of uh, you know finishes or uh, different types of you know garment construction techniques yeah, that maybe I could see translating into uh, a final garment later. <clears throat> right, interesting. So Abhay Shinoi is asking, um, I want to know what motivated you to choose fashion design and uh, when did you realize that fashion design is meant for you? I know that you had answered this at the beginning of the session, yeah. but okay, uh, yeah. let's throw some light on that. 
yeah i'm happy to repeat so i think um, uh, like i was saying i i think until like my uh, middle school i was again under the whole um, you know concept that i would take take a conventional you know sort of career option maybe as an engineer or uh, i wasn't really sure actually but then i think uh, just sort of exploring more into uh, you know i enjoyed uh, drawing sketching making things um, so that's where my interest grew over you know my last years in school and um, i think someone i knew introduced me to the idea of nift again um, i didn't really know uh, what nift was i didn't really know what design was uh, i just knew i like to sketch essentially that was what that's where it started um and uh, yeah so then uh, i got introduced to nift and then the concept was so new and so it was a very novel idea of fashion design of getting to create something so uh, i was very happy to have supportive parents who were like okay if this is what you want to do yes uh, i think that's something that uh, we should definitely not take for granted having uh, supportive parents um so yeah i think um, that's where uh, and that's how i ended up Uh, in nift and i think uh, like i mentioned also in nift there's a there's an option that you have to explore different types of uh, design um, possibilities so again it could be if you don't necessarily want to go down the apparel route there's always communication that you can look at um, there's knitwear there's uh, accessory design so a lot of different avenues that you could once you're into the college you can uh, sort of branch off into as well and also i think i would like to again focus on the fact that uh, even though i studied apparel or fashion design i did not work in fashion design until i started my own brand so it was just the uh, the process or the the knowledge that i had accumulated there that i translated into a different uh, area of design which worked almost similar in a way it's just that the medium was different All right interesting So, um, Sonia is asking. Okay, it's a very interesting question. So, you spoke about how you create sustainable clothing, but how sustainable is fashion design as a career choice? So, this must be from a student who is very young and trying yeah. to explore fashion design as a career. So, what is your advice for sustainability? So, um. You can uh, okay. yeah, you can unmute yourself. I show you. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Thanks. So, I like I just want to sort of um, you know, go a little behind, uh, back in time or so. Fashion design was something that was started. Um, I mean, it's something that has always been there. The term hmm. may not have been there, but. uh you know the the process has always been there like even if you look at um in india if you look at in, in india obviously what the weavers and uh what even you know your uh, local artisans do is design at the end of the day like just sort of imagining uh, designs on on a sari is uh, right. is design right so uh, sustainability is actually quite inherent uh, in the in, in in the indian context because again um, it's something that is very uh, pure to oneself or very um, culturally um, you know you could say imbibed uh, because again you have uh, in the olden times you had maybe grandmoms who passed on their sarees to the moms who passed on again to the daughters so right. uh, that sort of culture is what sustainability is about at the end of the day it should is just about making sure that whatever it is that you design stands the test of time can right. uh, you know become a, a piece that you can treasure so and whatever the the, the product may be right because okay. i think it's just when fast fashion came um, into existence is when that whole concept uh, kind of got diluted so hmm. that we're, we're only looking at going back to where we started so that is that is something that all of us can do Pass, at the end of the day we've just termed it as fashion design but it's something that has always uh, been done correct so um so 
do you see that fashion design in future uh, would have scope like for a fashion designer professional yes definitely because um, if we look at it uh, clothing or fashion is one of the most basic needs of uh, you know of human beings along with hmm. food uh, you know like shelter clothing right it's the most basic of needs and uh, people are now more sort of um, interested in design as a whole hmm. design as a field in general is something that is that people are aware that it is something that uh, holds a lot of scope so i think it starts from the pyramid up uh, you know bottom up it starts from the most basic of needs which is clothing so it is definitely something that is needed right right okay so i'm getting two kinds of questions here so right. one is about um, getting into an ift like oh, what kind of preparation a student has to do and etc and yeah. the second is about your brand and the work that you are doing okay so what okay. i suggest is focus on your work and the brand that you are building and mm -hmm. um, um, around 5:30 we will be having Sean um, one of the directors of design coefficient labs he would be answering the questions like how to get into or how to uh, prepare for getting into an IFT or similar institutes all right so let us continue with uh, questions related to your profession and the business okay sure sadhana is asking is there any reason why you named your brand pomegranate <laughs> um yeah it's, it's it's a question we get asked all the time uh, pomegranate <laughs> has absolutely no meaning it's just a word play on uh, the fruit <laughs> right? so, um, right. i think it was very random um, we were completely we were brainstorming for i think a really long time maybe um, a whole week for that matter we had started a week before but then one day we sat down and we we're like we have to find a name for the brand and mm. i think we were completely out of ideas. We had no ideas at all, and we were just drinking juice together, which ended up being a you know pomegranate juice. And then I think we would in in you know you get into this zone where your brains all uh, loopy, your brain becomes mush, and then you're like, why don't we just like name it pomegranate, but like with a D and there's a grenade in between. So right. it was just a fun wordplay that we focused on. But then we did a little bit of research after that also. And we found out that in some cultures, uh, the fruit is a, a sign of, uh, you know, success or like fertility and like, um, so then we thought, okay, that's, that's a good sort of association to have with the brand as well. So uh, and that's how we decided to have pomegranate um, as the brand name. Interesting. Yeah. And um, uh, Shivani is asking what makes your company unique from other competitors? yeah so i think um, it's a good question because fashion is definitely um, a populated space because everyone uh, you know has tried their hand at like designing uh, apparel uh, and it is quite a populated space so i think um, initially when we started all the way back in 2016 there were very few um, you know ethical brands out there sustainable brands out there uh, but what we noticed was that all of them had a very high, you know, price point for uh, for a good reason because um, yeah, because um, uh, the processes are time taking. The processes are extremely man. They're all handmade at the end of the day. So uh, that's something that added to the cost of the product. So which immediately narrowed the. Uh, people that would be able to access it um, so that was something that we wanted to address we wanted to address the um, accessibility of our garment we wanted to make sure that people could actually afford to buy uh, the pieces that we make actually we looked at ourselves as consumers we wanted to be able to buy the pieces that we made so that's the main uh, problem that we tried to solve uh, I think that's when the whole concept of uh, upcycling or sort of looking at fabrics that uh, were regarded or gen were thought of as waste came about and that was one of the ways that we were able to achieve uh, a price a price point which works right now because um, 
we have products that start at 599 and go up to 3500 and most of the brands out there have products that start at 3500 so i think we have sort of met that gap uh, you know that bridges uh, fast fashion which is garments again that you know are available at 100 rupees 200 rupees to um, you know these highly um, sort of niche um, brands or organizations that are more expensive but are made um, in a transparent process so that was one way that we um, you know sort of set the market another way was definitely in our brand language or a brand communication uh, if you if you would have noticed all our images we have actually used uh, we like to call them non models so uh -huh. they are actually people that we know in real life so these are people that we've met in our network they're all fellow designers or um, they all have brands of their own so uh -huh. We requested them to actually be our model, uh, and you know, sort of, we we realized that this gives uh, the brand a sense of uh, approachability. So it makes people regard the brand as something that is not um, aspirational or something that they can't really uh, approach, or uh, you know, sort of. We've always faced the issue where the garment looks good on a model or on a on a you know dress form, but when you receive receive it at your end and you try it on doesn't quite look or fit the same way so with this model we realized that it makes the garment much more uh, approachable so that's another way through our brand communication that we have uh, tried to address um, and sort of set our brand apart okay so one uh, basic question okay so what makes a garment expensive or cheaper yeah okay so there are multiple processes that go into manufacturing of a garment uh, design is an expensive process so let's start with that right because uh, we're looking at the we're looking at the ideation process first uh, design is an expensive process again um, you know as a designer sort of gains uh, experience in the market you see much more uh, you know sort of streamlined and much better looking design coming out of that designer so that is something which is definitely um, that adds to the price um, then obviously when you look at the raw materials mm -hmm. when you look at a, a handmade product versus a, a machine made product right so again a whole lot of ingredients that go into manufacturing that uh, in our case let's take fabric right so if you're looking at manufacturing of the fabric there are yarns that you have which is again you know a sub, which is uh, you know the where you start with are yarns they are like threads right um, what is the material of that thread it's uh, if it's uh, cotton if it's just regularly made cotton it could be cheaper but if it's organic cotton which is essentially made um, the cotton plant itself is made with uh, no pesticides with uh, you know sort of no um, synthetic sort of material that is you know applied onto the plant itself again obviously the plant takes longer to grow it uh -huh. takes longer for the person to collect it it takes longer for the person to sort of uh, and that's what sort of adds to the expense the time factor and then again when you have someone who's hand sort of um, you know hand spinning is a process where you convert the uh, raw yarn into a, like a thread like uh, a continuous right. roll that is a handmade process right so khadi is actually always hand spun that's why uh -huh. khadi was expensive because again it takes uh, there's only uh, you know the speed of human hand is definitely much slower than like a machine that can go at like 10 times the speed possibly but it adds or it generates income for that person who's doing it uh it right. sort of there's, there's definitely a difference in the quality of the fabric that is generated um you know through a hand spun hand woven fabric uh, uh -huh. as opposed to a mill made or like a power loom uh, fabric so that's the process and um, another when we come to the manufacturing or the production side another area or like that i want to touch that i want to touch base on is uh, again manufacturing of garments is a very um, gray area so nobody really 
observes a lot of the manufacturing plants where clothing is made and all of them you would notice is in developing countries right so we all if you check our uh, garment tags you would see that it's made in probably india bangladesh cambodia so all in developing countries the question that needs to be asked is if the brand is selling the garment at 200 rupees how much did the person who made the garment uh, get paid Correct. And the answer is minimal. They they don't even make minimum wage. They don't make enough to buy themselves a meal for a day. So that is why we realize that we need to make sure that the process that we set is. Uh, so that's where ethical comes in. So when you talk about ethical, that's we are looking at the human aspect of it. We're not looking at the product aspect, which is sustainability. Ethical is making sure that the process is not uh, exploiting anybody in the process so that's right. why when we started the brand we made sure that wherever we work the people that uh, work get paid fair wages they actually get paid above fair wages which is uh, needed in a situation like uh, we have currently so um, that's in the production aspect where uh, expense gets added on uh, and yeah, and the, the rest of it is something also again with uh, when you look at photography and all of that, that I think uh, could um, when you look at smaller brands, right, they have mm. only a certain budget that is uh, put aside for that. If you look at bigger brands, they probably have retainers or, uh, you know, uh, people that they work with on a regular basis, which reduces their cost. But for smaller brands, they they don't produce as much which adds to the factor of sustainability, right? Because um, they don't need people going and buying clothing every two weeks. If you buy one well-made uh, garment that could last you a year or two years, um, that's all you need. You don't really need, you know, like 50, 60 pieces as opposed to maybe just 20 well-made pieces. Right. Yeah, so right. all these factors like that I mentioned add to the final cost of the government. Final cost of the government. Only. So uh, Sasha wants to know, uh, how did you start after your college? So did you intern somewhere or did you start off with the brand or what yeah. was your journey after the college? So I think um, my introduction to the industry was in my third year of college where they have a mandatory uh, internship project that all of, all of the students have to go through. So um, it was a three month project that uh, everyone had to go through. And I did that uh, at one of the export houses in Bangalore. Um, that was my first introduction to, uh, you know, the fashion industry or the garment industry. Uh, and after which I think this was 2008, 2012, it was the whole time of the recession. So the fashion industry as a whole was, a little, was hit uh, a little bit. So um, at that point of time, through placements, I uh, entered into the field of visual merchandising, which is, again, a form of communication design, if you think about it. So you're trying to communicate, um, you know, through sort of uh, the arrangement or the sort of um, arrangement, uh, I said arrangement, arrangement or display of products in a retail environment. And you want to add to, uh, you know, sort of, um, you want to encourage people to buy through visual merchandising so that's the field uh, that i entered into right after college um, i did not know anything about visual merchandising i learned it completely on the job i don't have a technical knowledge about it but it's all about what i learned trying to do it um, you know in the place that i worked after which I actually went uh, and worked uh, internationally in Bahrain. Uh, that's where I grew up, actually. I grew up in the Gulf in the place called uh, Bahrain. So I went back there and I worked for a little bit with a, with a UK brand. It, it was a UK departmental store and I worked there as um, a visual merchandiser as well, uh, which was a good exposure to see how brands work differently. So in the Indian context, it was all about uh, exploration you 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 uh, as a designer get to sort of manufacture the process or the or the products you want to display in the store whereas in the international situation you had a preset uh, you know uh, guideline that would come to you almost every other month and they would just be like this is what the uh, look has to be 
so you just need to sort of implement that look so i think that was where um, you know i think in that situation was when my creativity wasn't quite being utilized as much and uh, it was almost like frustration led to um, you know me sort of thinking about uh, getting out out there on my own uh, and yeah so then since then is when i've uh, you know i primarily took some time um, after this job to uh, set up the branch to ideate about how to go about um, generating it i think i had some savings from uh, you know that i had sort of kept aside for this and i focused on you know converting that uh, to help me with the brand yeah all right cool okay so we will uh, um, you know we have some more questions we'll ask you aishwarya but uh, um, i would like to give uh, some time for dion our uh, sure. marketing head he has a few announcements to make all right and then we'll get yeah. back to you and i uh, will ask the further yeah. questions all right okay yeah, thanks. so uh, dion can you please uh, take over are you there Ye yes sumesh i am here thanks a lot uh, can you hear me yes i can hear you and uh, i gave you the control to share your screen as well okay i have not received it yet i'm still unable to share my screen um so I still am not able to share my screen. You are DQ Labs organizer. Is that your um, name? No, I think it is Dion D. Sir. Dion D. Sir, just a minute. Yeah. Yeah, just a minute. Or I think yes. Fantastic! Thank you so much, uh, Umesh, and thank you so much, uh, Aishwarya. It's been a brilliant uh, conversation so far, um, and really inspiring. Uh, but just to tell everyone out here a little bit about DQ Labs, we transform your hobby for art into a career. I'm just going to take two minutes to tell you what we do. Um, so at DQ Labs, what we do is we transform ideas into opportunities, all right? So uh, what happens is a lot of y'all are creative and a lot of y'all uh, like to draw stuff. And what we do is we channel that creativity into something useful, all right? So if you see here, there's an ideation process that you go through, and that's what we really guide you on. And what you see that Siddharth has done, Siddharth has uh develop this logo um, and with his whatever technology or whatever abilities had he's made this okay now the value of this is actually creating a brand all right so that's what we help uh, help siddharth do and um, of course like siddharth uh, there are you know everyone has an opportunity to get into um, whether it's architecture or design or fashion, and there are tremendous opportunities in this field, and we are here to aid you with that. Uh, DQ Labs has been founded by Umesh and Sean. Both are designers from IIT Delhi. Umesh is a TEDx speaker and worked with Jaguar Land Rover and Hyundai Motors. He also is the founder of DQ Labs and Example. And Sean was his classmate in IIT Delhi. And Sean has been with General Motors as well for a few years before uh, uh, co-founding DQ Labs and Example along with Umesh. Now, uh, Example is a platform that is an award-winning platform. It's won the NASCOM Design for India 2019 award as a brilliant platform that all our students have access to. And we would love it if uh, all over here start using the DQ Edge platform. Um, what we are into as as uh, as DQ Labs is we are researchers. We are research. We do a lot of research in learning design. That is uh, what needs to be taught has to be learned effectively. And this our research has also been presented in uh, Singapore at a learning design and technology conference. Um, what you are going through is the e-meet today is the industry e-meet we have aishwarya here who's taking today's session but previously we've had a lot of other designers and architects and going forward we will always have a have a designer and architect coming in every sunday all right 
we also, for those of you who have not participated in our free online sketching program, please uh, join us for this free learn sketch design program. We'll, we'll be happy to have you guys here. It's a three day program for free. Um, we also have a lot of in this, uh, interactions with school uh, representatives. So a lot of design schools, architecture schools, fashion schools. Um, we have our regular services as well, which is the design exploration program for students of ages 12 to 20. Uh, so if you have brothers, sisters, or you yourself want to take this up, it's great. Uh, we have skill development programs for just about anybody. Uh, we have entrance exam coaching for NATA, NID, NIFT, UC, SEED, FTDI, all the private design schools. We also give portfolio guidance to uh, those who want to pursue their further education or those who just want to be professionals in its in industry. All right. Our results have been excellent. We've had uh, four first rankers uh, from the from the NID PG 2020 program. Uh, we've had a lot over 50 NID UG students. This, this uh, students have cracked around one. Uh, this has, by the way, almost gone up to about 60. Uh, we've had students who cleared UC. A lot of them have cleared UC. We got a 99.92 percentile in JE Paper 2 2020. Over 110 DQ Lab students have cleared NIFT 2020 as well. All right. So uh, do follow us on instagram and facebook search for dq labs on google give us a review follow us every week you will get to know about us um, you can also contact us we are centers all across india and uh, we also teach students globally so if you have friends and relatives globally we could do that for you as well all right that's a little bit about from me about DQ Lab. All the best to all of you here. And Umesh, you can continue. Let me stop sharing the screen. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Dion. Um, so, Aishwarya, um, few students would like to understand um, have you tried to do a master's program or what were your thoughts on doing a master's program? And for okay, those. So to not yeah. know, Aishwarya has done her bachelor's of fashion design from NIFT. Okay, so I guess some people have joined late, so they're asking, okay, where did you do your fashion design? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I did uh, my bachelor's in NIFT under uh, apparel design. So that was my uh, spe specialization that I took. Um, I did consider mm -hmm. master's. So I did sort of. Um, look at a lot of avenues. I was particularly interested in sort of approaching, uh, you know, Central St. Martins, and I did go down that road a little bit. Um, I had a chance to interact with one of their representatives also, and their, um, the way that they sort of, uh, you know, approach design was really interesting to know as well. Uh, but for me, at that point of time, it was, um, you know, it was between starting the brand or, uh, you know, sort of going for a higher education. Uh, I think at that point of time, I I thought the concept of starting a brand was much more exciting. Um, although after which, uh, at this point of time right now, I am following and following up on my education with a um, executive course in management at IIM. So I thought that was something that um, has helped, would help me sort of understand the business aspect of it a little bit more. Uh, one thing that uh, you know uh, at that point of time in college, when I was in college, something that was missing uh, in their curriculum was a little bit about, uh, you know, business and marketing and financing. How does a designer sort of approach areas such as that? So um, I think since then, there's been a lot of uh, courses that have been added in, um, you know, the into their syllabus. But um, right now, I'm I'm looking at um, management and, uh, you know, how to sort of grow the business as um, an area of interest to study. So that's what I'm doing right now um, as well. Right. So when you uh, when you started your brand on your own, I mean, along with your uh, partner, okay, what were some of your biggest fears and how did you overcome them? Right. Um, I think, yeah, the biggest fear was definitely 
uh, would this be able to sustain me would the brand be able to sustain uh, you know myself and uh, how do i sort of see it uh, generating income and you know the thing is um, as designers i think i worked primarily on just designing um, i did not know anything about uh, you know marketing i think just like what i touched about before marketing i had mm -hmm. no idea how to maintain accounts i had no idea um, so all of that was something that i had to work between i had to focus on designing at the same time i had to make sure that uh, word was getting out there about the brand i had to make sure that i was looking at uh, you know the balance sheet for the month and making sure that uh, you know even if i think in the beginning we did not really make a profit for uh, for some time uh, but then just to sort of see and understand when it is that you could see the business being sustainable as a business Uh, so all of that was something that was uh, learnt in the process of running the business so yeah obviously um, initially i think when we entered it was all about it was it was a it, i was a blank like i had not a lot of understanding but uh, yeah it was just about facing challenges head on even if it's things that you don't really want to do like even um, you know like legal processes like setting up Uh, you know bank account or like uh, you know visiting your ca uh, gst filing all of that is something that is still so um <laughs> if if you mention it i get really annoyed but it's something that has to be done um, you know on a monthly basis yeah as a designer you just sort of <laughs> have to put aside the designer part of you and have to sort of balance between right brain and left brain almost absolutely and, and as an entrepreneur you have to take multiple roles in your business yeah and what i feel is unfortunately that kind of exposure and education is not generally imparted in uh, in the schools either in architecture or fashion or design schools in general yeah yes yeah. they are trained you to become uh, uh, a professional at your trade but that is just mm -hmm. not enough <laughs> yes and <I> agree. Uh, <laughs> when we come out into the industry and when we are starting on our own we learn a lot of stuff i'm still learning yes. a lot of stuff All yes right? exactly so, i think that's why and, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's just so many things that uh, it's a whole different world out there which is why i i would like implore all the you know aspiring designers to just intern in any design firm under any capacity because uh, that gives you a lot more um, information true true okay so and uh, prem is asking how much does institute from where you do your fashion designing matters there are many institutes but yes and i have to tell you being talk of the town um, what's the take on on all private institutions yeah um i think again back in 2008 when i was looking at joining uh, you know a fashion institute there were not a lot of options uh, again there was nift uh, i think pearl was there at that point of time and nid so these were the three options that was available at that point of time but since then there have been so many um, actually amazing institutes i can say that because um, we've had a lot of uh, students writing in for internships and sharing their portfolios and the work that they do is really good like amazing work so i think um they are definitely um, you know sort of uh, they have really invested in sort of um, nurturing the students and sort of giving them that exposure i think also definitely um, they also go down a lot of different avenues that possibly nift um, uh, doesn't really explore as much being a you know a deemed government institute so private institutes definitely do have um, their positives as well yeah so that's just my take um, you know my observation on what i've seen of the students who've gone there yeah absolutely and uh, nazia is asking uh, where did you get the idea to design your brand logo it looks very interesting okay so i have to thank my uh, brand partner for that madhu uh, so she is a graphic designer uh, she is a um, she is a packaging designer also so uh, that she she handles all the uh, you know collateral as such so yeah i mean i i try uh but yeah definitely almost she does way better work than i do so yeah okay. she i all all hats off to her for that okay that's pretty cool all right 
Um, okay, so there are a few more questions which are related more about the uh, getting into an ID or an IFT and these institutes. Okay. Right. Um, I'll just uh, invite Sean to answer these questions, but uh, uh, meanwhile, uh, what is your advice for mm -hmm. uh, for the design aspirants and also how, what kind of attitudes a design aspirant should build in them? Many a times I hear from uh, parents, okay, so they personally talking to me saying that, okay, my child is a bit sensitive, any harsh feedback or a critic given will mm -hmm. really demotivate them. And uh, uh, this kind of uh, feedback I sometimes get from some parents, okay? Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is my personal opinion. Being a designer, we have to be uh, open for critical feedback. And we want to understand that all that is for the improvement of work. And it is our discretion what to take and what not to take to move forward. Right. So, what what do you think? Uh, how a positive attitude or a, an attitude to take the critic, and how yeah. it can be developed, and what is the yeah, importance definitely. of that? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think the biggest uh, personality trait that you can have as a designer is just to be open, right? So I think, like Mr. Mesh said, um, definitely be open to criticism first. Uh, it is it is a bit of a journey sometimes because sometimes we are so emotionally attached to what we design. Sometimes we make something and we just love it. We are we're just so in love with it that uh, we can't really look at it from another another person's point of view, maybe. Um, and I think something that every designer should know first and foremost is that you're not designing for yourself. You're always designing for somebody else. And um, at the end of the day, you need to be open to others inputs to see uh, maybe they would be able to open you up to uh, an avenue that you didn't even explore. You didn't even know existed. Um, so I think that is definitely the best characteristic to have is to be open. And again, uh, you know, just um, also try to retain what is important and the rest just let go. I mean, that's that's the only way that you have to push forward and yeah definitely to explore different ways to enhance your creativity so it could be a field that um, is not something that you were maybe interested in but just sort of explore that area see if it's something that you could possibly excel in um, at the end of the day because again like if i'm looking at my brand situation right now uh, we have to wear many hats even as a designer starting from uh, I think like like we were talking about graphic design to uh, garment design to even photography right so again communication so all of that is different avenues that we had to um, explore and excel at uh, for the brand to excel so uh, definitely just trying out different things as well yeah right and uh, if you don't mind can you uh, let us know certain moments in your professional career where were which were really tough and how did you overcome them? I think um, if I have to speak personally, there was a whole lot of, um, especially into the first job, it was a completely different environment. Um, I, I would like to say as personality-wise, I'm quite introverted. Um, um, I'm, I'm a you know, sort of want to be ex extrovert. So <laughs> I think um, as a designer, my first thing in my first job was I had to talk to a lot of vendors. I had to talk to a lot of um, designers and some really high profile designers. And at that point of time, there was a whole lot, lot of like self doubt. And I was like, what if I say something really silly or something that, uh, you know, is quite obvious to, uh, that should be quite obvious as a designer. So that was something I had to overcome this whole, um, you know, the ability to have confidence in what I do, to have, you know, to portray confidence in a way. Uh, so that's something that was one challenge uh, from like a, uh, you know, sort of personality front. Another challenge, um, I guess, uh, that I still face 
is sort of keeping up with uh, what's happening, you know, in, a, in the design field and uh, in, again, in the sustainability field as well. Design is ever, you know, evolving. It doesn't stop. Like there's no one way to do anything for that matter. Design processes change uh, nonstop. So I think just being able to sort of uh, keep up with that um, is also a challenge. But that's a very interesting challenge. That's something that keeps me excited. Right. Yeah. Right. That's cool. OK. So um, any other questions anybody has? Um, as I said, um, by 5.30, Sean will be coming online so we can ask certain questions uh, related to the school's preparation and et cetera, okay? So Aishwarya, how do you keep your creativity and innovation top notch? What do you do? I mean, do you, uh, do you do some kind of an exercises like brain exercises or how do you sharpen or how do you ensure that your creativity is on top level all the time? Yeah, so I think um, definitely, like I said before, I uh, I doodle quite a bit. Anytime I sort of uh, feel like, uh, you know, I'm stuck in a rut, I doodle. Um, I always go back to, uh, you know, referencing from magazines, books, and, um, you know, just sort of, uh, I read, I, I just sort of maybe look at like, documentaries and things like that that's another avenue that i try and yeah i mean like i said before so i i love always working with fabric uh, working with hand so that's something that i always focus on try to sort of create something uh, tangible as well hmm. so I, I take multiple approaches you know depending on what um, I feel like doing at that point of time or what I have available to me at that point of time and like I said always uh, you know sort of reaching out to people uh, just asking for their input at times I if I may have multiple you know design problems I just always consult with somebody it could be uh, you know a mentor or like a colleague or a friend I just talk to them I, I try to if, if I'm faced with a challenge I see um, you know, what suggestion maybe they could have or how they approach the, the, the problem. Um, yeah, so these are just different ways that I approach, uh, you know, okay. a creative rut. Right. So, uh, Sean, are you online? Uh, yes, Vish, uh, I'm online, oh, yeah. All right, okay. So before we ask, uh, you certain questions about the college's preparation and etc. Okay. Um, one of the parents has asked me to ask you this question. All right. So you are an engineer and a designer. Okay. So how was your journey have been? Did you find any difference? Was the engineering field helpful or would you have been done uh, if you had been done uh, design? Without doing engineering, would that be helpful? Uh, could you just uh, throw some light on that? Okay, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, it's a question I get quite often. Okay, and uh, yes, I've I've had the opportunity of uh, you know even working with engineers, working in a very technical environment. As well, like for example, I've worked in like Tata Motors, uh, also in the uh, production side. Uh, I've I've worked as an engineer on, on on different levels, as well as I have worked as a um, uh, a designer, uh, obviously uh, in the many design departments. And yes, of course, I've had the um, experience from both sides. So yes, it's a question uh, I get quite often, and uh, you want to answer that. Well, first of all, I can see a lot of people, a lot of mindsets, especially parents, that uh, they think that uh, engineering is a very safe bet. Uh, it's like, okay, do your bachelor's in engineering first and then, uh, you know, uh, do uh, your master's in BDES and MDES. Uh, you know, uh, a, a lot of, a lot of uh, uh, parents said that. In fact, Prem, I can see one question right now on the screen. It says, what if one goes for engineering first? Uh, and then do design uh, as your masters, or is it better to have a B as and an M -des? Okay, 
So first of all, the answer to that question is, um, what are you really interested in doing? Okay, let's say, 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 say two case scenario. Okay, the first case scenario is you are a 12 standard student. Okay, and the second case scenario is you are an engineering student. Okay, so let me answer the second case scenario is okay i am an engineering student i'm not done my masters in the, i'm not done design obviously i didn't take the design area however i'm extremely interested i like to draw i like um, i like animation i like uh, product design i like fashion design i like uh, anything to do with design okay design fascinates me i mean this is something that i can i can draw i can do things on a vacuum tablet i like to play with photoshop i like graphic uh, I'm, a, I'm an engineering student. I'm maybe in the second year, third year, or fourth year of engineering or medicine or whatever it may be. Okay. So if sometimes students realize that at that stage that they want to do their masters, yes, of course, go and do your masters in design. That's an obvious solution. Okay. But the but the the, the tough solution, is, the tough question here is for a 12 standard student. Okay. What should a 12 standard student do who has not yet started their engineering? Should they do the engineering first or should they go into uh so should they go and do a bdes okay a bachelor's in design now to answer that question um the first thing a person should ask himself or herself is uh, uh what am i interested in okay it all boils down to that what is my what is my passion what am i interested in what what is it that i could do morning moon and night what is it i enjoy doing okay and if that answer is, I like to be a designer, okay? I want to be a designer, whether it's uh, industrial design, communication design, IT integrated design, fashion design, architecture, interior, whatever it may be, okay? If your passion is, I want to be a designer, then I would definitely say, um, go and do your bachelor's in design. I will come to your question. I know I won't answer your question. But I would say do your bachelor's in design because that is something that's really going to help you. Okay. Now, why do people still have this question? Is because of lack of confidence. Okay. So it can be two things. One is you are still interested in doing um, uh, in engineering, or number two is is it lack of confidence? Lack of confidence is you know what? I think engineering is safe for that. I think um, uh, uh, design is not so safe for bachelor's in design. So maybe it's the lack of confidence. So, so to answer your question is maybe you should understand the opportunity in design, the opportunity in, even if you do a BDES, right, and you go and work, uh, what are the opportunities of companies hiring you on an industrial production level, on a, on a visual communication level, on all levels, okay? So if you do that, number one, it might give you confidence, okay, of taking a BDES uh, immediately instead of doing a master engineering and then do BDES. Now, let me talk from a different point of view. Having done my engineering, right? Uh, how much has it actually helped me? Okay, this might be the question. How much has the engineering actually helped me um, for uh, for my master's in design? Now, if you see engineering subjects, right? If I look back at my engineering subjects, uh, thermodynamics, thermodynamics uh, uh, material handling, uh, so, uh, production planning or uh, operations research or whatever it may be. To be honest with you, how much of it you don't remember even the next day after the exam is over, okay? You're studying, you're answering, you're doing so much for the exam, but how much How much of that actually practically helps you in real life, okay? Uh, I've done my industrial production engineering. How much of it actually helped me when I did my master's in design from a technical point of view? To be honest with you, nothing really other than, you know, okay, yes, you do get your uh, design degree. You have, it's like certified that, oh, this person has sat and studied all these engineering subjects, but how much does it actually help you? Not really much, okay? For example, even if we are doing a, a project, right, in, uh, in as, as industrial designer, okay, I did industrial design. Now, let me give a couple of cases, right? Uh, number one, I work as, um, I work in, uh, in an automobile field or I work in the medical industry, okay? So if you work in the medical industry as a designer, you need to actually go, like say if some of our batchmates are working for Johnson & Johnson, okay? And they are doing R&D, they, they, they have a lot of patents in their name. They actually go and observe um, hip re replacement surgeries, knee replacement surgeries, and in today's scenario, the amount you can read 
learn on your own is 10 times more than what you've done in the past. Meaning, uh, every time you're a consultant and you do a small project, you have to study about that project. It doesn't matter what that project is. You have to go online. You have to read about, uh, you have to read about uh, products in that area. You have to read about technology in that area. You literally have to do your mini research and mini study all over again, okay? So the answer to your question is, a creative side of you and a logical side of you, okay, rather than an engineering side of you. If you have a logical side to you, it doesn't matter what degree you have, you can always read and be highly technical in what you do, okay, whatever miniature micro project you do, okay. Now, having said that, as a designer, you can work on different levels. You can work for a large company, a huge organization, you can work for a very small company with hardly 10, 15 people, okay. If you work for a large organization, uh, like what I did, General Motors, okay, there are specialized people even within the de design department to do different things, okay? Like if, you're, if your job is only sketching, there is somebody to do uh, uh, digital modeling, there is somebody, there's somebody specialized to do uh, your mock-up models, there is somebody, there, engineering is, there are hundreds of people to do the specialization. You don't have to do that. You need to focus on what you want to do, your creative part, and and that and that's it. Of course, it's not that you don't understand what's happening. You do understanding what you do understand what's happening across other departments, but it's really not your job. Okay, there are other people to handle. Um, once, if you're working for a much smaller organization, then yes, a lot more jobs you're doing. You're also doing the design. You're also doing the um, prototyping, computer modeling. You're doing everything. Okay, and quite a bit of little bit of engineering technology also you're understanding, which very frankly, even as a pure designer be it as MDS degree, you have the aptitude, you can do it, okay? So my answer to your question is you do not need to do your engineering. Uh, you can, you can do it, but you don't have to do it. And I have found out that if you're really seriously interested in design and you want to do design, those who did the architecture or be actually had a much better advantage. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, uh, Sean. Yeah. Uh, Sean? Yes, yes. Yeah, all right, great. So, um, uh, very well said. See, in our situations, it was very different. Okay, so, for example, I had an architecture, and then I realized to do uh, design. I came to know about design when I was in the fifth year of architecture, right? I didn't know about design, uh, that design world exists before that. Okay, so... Right. At least in my case, I can say that my exposure at that particular point of time was not that high. And maybe if I was given that exposure at a very young age to choose between be art and be design, my choice would have been different. So the first and foremost important thing is to give exposure to the children about the available possible available careers in the, in the field of creativity, like architecture, fashion, design, and then, yes, if they're interested in uh, design, uh, go ahead and definitely. Uh, okay. Um, Sean, Kavika is asking, can you just give you an overview of an IFT entrance exam? Uh, okay, uh, uh, I can I can do that. Uh, I can do that, Kavita. Uh, but just to continue on what you said, uh, yes, you're right. Those realize at a later date that there is a design field. Of course, there's a different. Uh, obviously, it's a different sort of place for you. But what I was saying is, for those who are in the grand standard and who can make a conscious choice. Okay, now Prem has written here. Uh, see, an interesting thing. Fashion alone. Passion alone cannot guarantee success. Okay. At the same time, uh, passion. Uh, at the same time, every passion can become a career. Uh, for for uh, passion to become a career, it must be coupled with the right set of skills. Okay. Uh, Prem, um, uh, if you are really passionate uh, and if you work hard and you're consistent towards it, in today's world, there is enough number of opportunities for you to do extremely well. Okay. But you should be passionate. You should be good at what you do, and you should be persistent, work hard. Uh, for example, I know a person from a very, very ordinary design institute, very ordinary design institute, who is, who is today working as a 
who is working as a designer car designer in detroit okay that's one of the toughest things to get into and it's in fact it become a car designer is as tough as getting into a you know like a like a formula 1 team or something like that. it's really difficult uh, but this person from literally no background has is working as a car designer in detroit and i have seen cases like this and the gone are the days where uh, there is no opportunity today there is opportunity and people are willing to pay for any specialization and any course and and if you if you are passionate you can do it uh, i i have seen that, I've seen that myself okay sorry um what is an overview of the uh, nift entrance exam okay uh, basically um, the nift okay just to put it in a nutshell very fast uh, nift exam has got two parts to it you have the round one and you have the round two okay the round one is a, is a written paper which uh, filters a set of students uh, it is held in the month of uh, jan jan in feb uh, first week basically jan feb in those months those who clear uh, uh, round one of NIFT get the opportunity to go and do their situation test or round two, which happens in the usually all these years happens in the month of May. Okay, so to give you a quick overview about round one and round two, uh, uh, round one has um, um, has uh, uh, three sub it has um, uh, two exams. One is your GAT and a CAT. Okay, uh, uh, your GAT is a exam which tests for uh, your math skills your, it tests you for math skills your aptitude skills and your basic gk skills in the world of fashion like say for example basic gk skills and also gk skills in the world of fashion you should know about fashion brand ambassadors and things like that okay so uh, you have a gat which is held in the morning and you have a cat where your creative ending in the afternoon okay now your creative aptitude test test you for drawing. Okay? Uh, it has uh, basic questions on a theme sketch or a 2D graphic sketch, an environment it's sketch, a... and a product. Yeah. Uh, details, exact details about. Okay, exact exact questions of uh, what type of questions are being asked. Maybe there are other webinars that uh, maybe there are other webinars that we will have to tell you exactly what sort of questions are have. Where we can go into into more detail. But I'm just telling you very roughly. Your round one has a GAT test in the morning and a CAT test in the afternoon. GAT has math, aptitude, and uh, uh, fashion uh, related GK, and the afternoon paper is a creative paper where they will test you for your theory, your drawing skills, your graphic skills, your product design skills. Yes, you have to draw a miniature product or things like that. Okay. Uh, if those who clear that, go to a round two situation test. And in the situation test, you learn about material. You, you, you will be uh, asked questions on material handling, where they will actually give you some materials and some model to build, like uh, create a futuristic shoe or create a, a fashion ramp or create a kiosk. Uh, you're supposed to make something with your hands. Uh, and also kind of draw and give a small write up about it okay and those who clear round two according to your ranks you get into you can choose your nips that is in very brief but we will have extensive uh, information on how to go about the nift exam and the kind of topics asked in a different webinar okay umesh do i answer another question um, yes, Sean. So uh, we are having a lot, a lot of these webinars and uh, e-meets and all that. Okay, and um, if you want to know how we can guide you for cracking these NID and IFT NATA entrance exams, kindly um, get in touch with us on WhatsApp on 959-100-1220 so that we can uh, spend more time with you and we can also uh, guide you accordingly. All right. So um, yes, Sean, we can answer the next question. In fact, so, there is an, it's an interesting question here by Prem. OK, he says, I do understand you have an online program, which is a good one. And he's compared it to other coaching centers, whatever mm -hmm. he has. OK, what more could you guide to accelerate creativity and thinking? Can I answer that question? Yes, please. Okay, Prem, this question is for you, uh, which you posted at uh, 1721 
okay, 1721. So he says, I understand you have BQ Labs has an online program. That's a good one as compared to other coaching centers. I'm not going to name them. It's it's written there on the, uh, typed in there, or I would consider it as other coaching centers. What more would you do to guide, accelerate to, what more do you do to guide to accelerate creative and thinking? Okay, fine. Um, now in general, okay, whether it is any creative exam, okay, whether it is round one, round two, or any creative exam or a portfolio or whatever it may be for uh, any any institute, okay, whether it's an Indian institute or institute abroad or whatever. Okay, first of all, uh, an, in, an institute in India has a different style of going about it, and an institute abroad has a different style of going about it, which is your portfolio. So let's not get into the portfolio for now. Let's let's answer this question very specifically from an Indian uh, exam point of view because our style is different. Our style is we are given an exam, we are supposed to write, draw, or make your materials within that given amount of time, and whatever you do in that time is, uh, that's it, okay? In fact, I've seen cases where some brilliant students who are excellent in their creativity and all still don't go through these exams, okay? So basically it's, so this is how, how it basically is. Number one is your basic skills has to be good. There's no two ways about that. When I say your basic skills has to be good all rounded. Uh, you should be good in your aptitude. You should be good in your creative thinking. Uh, you should be good in your material handling. You should be good in your drawing. Okay, that there's no two ways about it. The second thing is um, you should be able to, you should have a strategy. This is the most important thing. Okay, when you say strategy is you should know what to study and what not to study, where to focus and how to focus your, your thing, your, your, your energy. Okay. Um, uh, you have to have a strategy for how you're going to uh, answer the exam as well. For example, you're really good in uh, only drawing and you're not good in aptitude uh, is of no use, okay? Or even the other way around is really not gonna help you get into the top institutes. Um, at the same time, you should be all-rounded. You should be also good in your GK. How to go about GK is a style by itself. And more importantly, you should be able to do everything within the time given, okay? That's one point of view. But the second point of view, uh, uh, which is extremely important is, uh, number one is, yes, I have the skills, I can draw, I can draw fast, uh, I can complete things within the given amount of time. But most important is, what are you doing? Okay, what is, how are you bringing your creativity? How are you bringing your uniqueness? How are you bringing, um, uh, how are you answering the question, but in an amazing way, in an amazing way that uh, people have not, you know, they look at your, answer and they say, wow, okay, I mean, literally they should say, wow, what a what a nice innovative idea, okay? So this, the, the difference here is uh, what DQ Labs does is DQ Labs actually trains you on a very fundamental level. Of course, yes, we give you all the basic skills that uh, you require for the exam, but we do something which is little more than that, which is, which is which we train you as a designer. We train you to think as a designer. We train you to think as an, as a person in the first place, okay? That is very important, and that you know boils down through all the small exercises that we do. Um, how does that happen? It happens through exposure, exposure to uh, you know amazing design, exposure to amazing ideas, discussing good ideas, bad ideas. It's something that Umesh, me, and the faculty in in DQ Labs have actually gone through ourselves. We have gone through these exams. We have passed these exams ourselves. We have seen, we have made our mistakes. We have seen, uh, for example, for example, um, I'll tell you what actually, why I think I can teach better. I had um, I had a faculty in, uh, in IIT Delhi, okay? He was amazing. He was the best car uh, person who could draw cars than anyone I have ever met, okay? He was unbelievable. You name the car, you name the angle of the car, he will start off from one point and his hand was like a printer, okay? Uh, and he would draw it on a blackboard. You ask him to draw it 100 times, he would do it over and over again, okay? But that's all he could do, okay? Meaning, we were students who didn't have skills. All he would do is come straight away and draw unbelievable cars. And all we were left is in state of shock and awe. And we were like, we used to actually lose our confidence. We used to think, okay, we can't do things like that, okay? And and his only thing was just do it, okay? He couldn't explain how to do it. So even if you have a really good teacher who does not 
understand the step-by-step -step process for you to get there. That's the big thing. So we have gone through these systems. We have learned the things. And, and I have seen over the past what actually students understand, what students don't understand. And when you go through these step-by-step -step processes, and, and, and there are certain uh, tests along the way that we do, where we build them, uh, you've got to go through step-by-step -step processes. You've got to give them good exposure. And you've got to make them fundamentally very strong. Because in case they change patterns, right? They change things. You should be ready for any surprise. Okay. Um, for example, I do a lot of uh, I do a lot of creative thinking exercises, and one of the exercises which I always do, I, I do a lot of st standard creative thinking exercises where I would show a, a material in the class and I would make people talk. Okay, just talk about it. Just I would pick up a pen, I would pick up a, a plug. I'm just saying these are the one of the many exercises that I did, and I would just do these as standard creative thinking exercises. Okay. And shockingly, it was asked in the NID exam last year for the round two. And uh, many of the students who practice this found this easy. So we do a lot of things, uh, including exposure is one of the main things. It's showing you high quality work, showing you high quality ideas from uh, from you know from all the people that we have studied and seen in the past or we have been fans of, which makes a difference. Become an independent thinker. I mean, from DQ Lab's point of view, it's not just an entrance exam. We don't want to, we want to make you one of the best, you know, at least from a thinking point of view, we want to give you like world-class exposure, right? And then and then everything just becomes easy. I hope that answers your question. Sorry. Uh, Umesh, next question. Uh, which one shall I answer? Right. Okay. So, so next question is for uh, Aishwarya. All right. So Aishwarya, so you yeah. have gone through NIFT and uh, you had put up your brand and etc. Right? If if you are given a new opportunity to mm -hmm. redo what you have done so far, would you be doing it differently or would you be doing the same? Thing? <laughs> um. Okay. Interesting. I've not thought about that, but um. Uh, how? What would I do differently? I think um, definitely I would take my own advice, which is uh, which would have been a little bit difficult back then. But yes, I would definitely take my own advice, which was definitely to go out there and work more and not just sort of uh, fall back on, uh, you know, just what is being done in a classroom environment. Yeah, mm -hmm. I think I would definitely have to just go back on my own advice to everyone out here. And yeah, just go out into the field. Uh, make things happen for myself yeah back then but yes definitely there weren't as many opportunities as there are now now you have a lot of even smaller brands and uh, smaller organizations that do need design uh, input so um, yeah i mean i wish that had been available to me also uh, back then but yeah definitely uh, i wouldn't change anything about starting the brand because it's it's taught me okay. so much so much about it yeah Okay, okay, okay. Umesh, and, uh, uh, Umesh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, right. uh, you're from Amani. Okay, huh? uh, basically, they says I have enrolled for an integrated program in my school where they are studying for entrance exams like JE. Okay, yeah. it would be a good idea to back out and get trained for design entrance exam. Okay, I would, I would like to answer that question or I'd like mm -hmm. to possibly comment on it. Okay, so some of you um, have been in, have enrolled for integrated programs in your school, where by default they teach you a lot for JE and CET. Okay, this is what I will have to say. Okay, a lot of schools, especially uh, our our schools, uh, you know, by default heavily have these programs, integrated programs for JE or, or your common entrance exams and whatever it may be. Okay, for for mainly for engineering. My, this is what I have to say. If you are interested in that, by all means, take that wholeheartedly and do it full time. But if you are not interested in that and you're more interested in a design entrance exam or an architectural exam, I would highly recommend please don't go for those uh, integrated programs and join. I'm don't say I'm not saying go join, come and join DQ Labs. Join, go anywhere or study on your own, whatever it may be. But don't waste your time on an exam that you're not really interested in. Okay, focus on an interest. Focus on an exam that you're really interested in. That's all I have to say. 
uh, even I have done this in my past, trying to do this and that and everything and waste a lot of time, okay? Focus on what you're interested in, what is your passion, and give it your best shot, okay? That's what I have to say. Sorry, Umesh, back yeah. to you. That's absolutely true. A lot of uh, students and parents, because of lack of awareness, um, they just uh, uh, get admitted to this integrated kind of a program and then they realize the student is interested in design and uh, they're in a dilemma whether to continue it or what to do. Okay, so as rightly said, uh, Sean, uh, even I had subscribed to that idea because I have personally seen uh, while mentoring uh, students, those who have tried to manage the engineering entrance exam and the design entrance exams, unfortunately could not do well in any one of those. They are highly yeah. talented guys, but then uh, once you get into this integrated engineering entrance exam program, so they will be pulled into that kind of a vortex. You know, ultimately they will not be left with any time They'll be under a lot of pressure, peer pressure, and uh, and all this arrives because they think, okay, my first preference is design, and they want to keep engineering as their second preference. That's a big, big mistake. Okay, I just like I, I just like to add to this. Okay, and all of you, all of you are, you know, all of you are listening. Hmm. Design department, like even in General Motors, the design department was the department all the engineers were dying to get into. Okay, uh, uh, not all, Ma many engineers. Now I won't say all, that's a wrong thing to say, many engineers. So, so many engineers would come and ask us, how do you get into the design department? They had no clue. They had no clue that there were such exams uh, uh, available like like SEED and UCED and, and all these exams. And they only realized it after they saw the design department, many of them, okay? And they were actually trying to get into the design department. And they were saying, okay, can I do my MDES now? Can I do my masters now? we could easily walk through the engineering department wherever we wanted engineering department cannot come and walk into the design department this is like highly secretive right True. it is it is it's more uh, uh, security is more controlled and the ideas come from the design department and from there it goes for engineering where they develop it so y'all all of you out there who have any doubts who don't have the confidence you must understand the design department is an extremely prestigious department to be in right i mean people don't understand uh, once you realize that understand Understand what R&D does. Understand the role of design in R&D, whether it is a, a manufacturing company like, say, for example, LG, Samsung, uh, um, uh, or your cell phone companies, uh, automobile companies, white goods, or uh, medical companies, electronic companies, uh, Apple for that matter, uh, UI, UX. See what's happening in their design departments and, and see how engineers actually want to go and see what's happening in the design department because first it starts from the design department and then it goes towards uh, either product uh, engineering or, or to some to a lot to a big extent you know software development and things like that um, yeah so let's see um Umesh, any other question you want to answer um yeah um so janani is asking what stream would you suggest uh, she takes in 11th and 12th if she wants to pursue design in college. Okay, would you like to answer that, Sean? Yes. Now, Janani, you want to take up a design after your 12th. The answer is you can take uh, any uh, stream in design, okay? Uh, sorry, any stream in your 12th, as long as it's a 12th standard equivalent degree. Please be careful. For those who want to take architecture, please be careful. Those who want to take architecture, you have to, in India, you have to take PCM, okay? But those who want, of you who want to take design, that is you want it to be uh, either NIFT or NID or UC, okay? You don't have to take PCM in your 12th. The only, let's say the top, if I say the top design colleges are NIDs, IITs, NIFTs, okay? So NIDs, there are five NIDs, IITs, there are three IITs so far, that is IIT Bombay, IIT Guwahati, IIT Hyderabad. Like only IIT uh, uh, Guwahati insists on a PCM. Listen to me very carefully. IIT Guwahati, only IIT Guwahati insists on a PCM. Um, uh, and I would say just for the sake of IIT Guwahati, don't take PCM, okay? Because all other designs colleges, including IIT Bombay, you don't need to take PCM. It just has to be a 12th and an equivalent degree and for all NIDs and all NIPs. So the answer to you, Janani, is you want to take design, you can take uh, 
any stream of uh, subjects in the 12th unless you don't want to let go of iit guwahati as well which i i would recommend don't do that if you don't like pcm don't take pcm only for that one college uh, but if you want to take a architecture you have to have pcm um uh, yeah. jigyasa yeah how can you how can one uh, study for nift preparation during the lockdown um dq labs has an online program you can get in touch with us all of you all who want to study for your uh, uh, during the lockdown you already have online programs you can study with us okay um, online classes and everything we have we have these programs okay umesh yeah all right yeah so cool so we are almost closing to our time so uh, one last uh, question to aishwarya aishwarya where are you seeing your brand in the future and what is your uh, what is your aspiration for your brand where would you want to see it in the future yeah i think um, what i would like to focus on more is impact generation the field of impact generation so what i mean by that is first the business has to be self sustaining it has to be able to um, you know sort of sustain um, you know us as Uh, brand partners uh, our employees all of that and sort of uh, be able to sort of uh, you know give us a good livelihood at the same time i would like to sort of impact as many uh, you know cluster groups or uh, as many artisans uh, as possible and sort of just create a design language through the brand so that's the future to be able to create um, you know a, a line uh, of clothing or of of the brand that you know you can look at it and almost immediately tell uh, that it's made by pomegranate we've been successful to a certain extent in that um, you know brand recognition as such but yeah definitely to sort of make the business model uh, more sustainable and sort of scale up um, and be able to employ more um, people more artisans more crafts people and create that impact in the process nice all right great so um i wish you all the best and uh, uh i really would like to see pomegranate um uh, going to places becoming big thank you yeah thank you that's that's great to hear and, uh, and i would uh, uh, like to thank you so much for uh, taking out time and uh, coming over here for interacting and sharing your knowledge sharing your journey with all the aspirants and their parents i think it is very important and it it uh, the session was very good the way you have uh, showcased the uh, the current fashion industry and its impact it is creating on the environment and how you are trying to change that impact into a sustainable uh, uh, environment okay that exposure okay. that the share the knowledge that you have shared is really appreciable thank you so much yes and thank and, you for uh, giving me a platform to sort of talk about this as well uh, hopefully you know uh, i was able to get out the message um, about uh, you know sort of how to approach uh, this field in a more sustainable way as well and how to sort of accept uh, you know smaller and more uh, transparent brands as a whole right right okay and um, we are also going to uh, host this particular recording we are recording the session we are hosting this recording on youtube so you can look for dq labs official channel on youtube and uh, we are available and there are also previous industry emits recording put up there so if you want to uh, listen to that please feel free to listen to that there is a lot of interesting knowledge being shared through this industry emits okay and then uh, i would also like to thank Sean for taking his time out and coming over here for addressing some of the questions parents had and what i suggest is uh, if you have any questions please send a whatsapp message to 9591001000 uh, please share your question and our counselor will get back to you and uh, uh, thank you all so much for spending your time uh, on a sunday evening Uh, oh, Mesh, I just want once want to answer two more questions before we stop. Okay, go on, Sean. 
Okay, quick question. Prem has asked a question. What? How do you train at home right now uh, for uh, NID mains? As of right now, classes are going on for NID mains. The classes is every is every morning at eight in the morning, eight o'clock in the morning uh, for two and a half hours. I am taking the sessions myself. Uh, four classes are over, and uh, uh, your you can join those classes if if you want. Okay, uh, those who want the classes are going on right now. Okay. That's one thing. But my last question I want to answer was from Amani. Amani, are you there? One minute. What was the question? Uh, oh, wait a minute. Let me get that question. Just hold on. Ah, okay. Ah, okay. Interesting question. What Amani says, what are my options if I don't get into a good design institute? Okay. Now, let's say, for example, you don't get into an NID or IIT or top lifts. It's not the end of the world. Okay, I have seen so many students getting into really good in other institutes and doing excellent, doing really well. In fact, some people have a very, um, a very wrong notion. They say, you know, if I don't get into NID or uh, uh, IIT, then I'll do engineering. That is so wrong, so wrong, so wrong. If you're dedicated to the field of design, if you don't get into one, then your second option should be a design school. Your third option should be a design school. Okay. Um, in fact, unfortunately, um, we don't, so far in our country, the number of seats in NID, IIT, or uh, NIF don't really justify the number of students answering the exams or, or the number of students wanting to be designers. So therefore, that means even if you are really, really good, sometimes you don't get through because of bad luck. So what happens to all these, uh, these students who are still really good and get into other schools? Let me just take from an NID point of view, I would easily say, uh, those who have scored even up to rank 1000 are really, really good. Okay. Unfortunately, the rank, uh, the cutoff is at 350 seats, uh, all India level. So even some students I know personally rank 400, 500, 600, 800 are really good. All the other, all the other schools are gaining and they're all going somewhere. Okay. So, so oh, there is a lot of opportunity. Uh, you can still be an amazing designer, no matter from which school you come. It all depends on you and how you make the most of it. For example, we had a classmate who came from quite an ordinary um, architecture school, and he entered a competition, uh, a, a competition held by Microsoft, uh, Microsoft uh, uh, for 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 a design competition, and he won the chairman's award. He was flown to Las Vegas, and he got a cash prize of 22 lakhs. Okay, and. And uh, he came from an ordinary institute, and then things just went through the roof after that. Once he put that on his resume, okay. So you can just it all. It's all up to you. You can you can do well no matter which institute you come out from. Okay. Sorry, I'm done. Omesh. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. So we we will uh, have more sessions on every Sunday, four o'clock to six o'clock. We are lining up very excellent speakers. It is very difficult to reach these guys, but we are getting them for your benefit. So please do attend uh, these e-meets every Sunday, uh, four o'clock to six o'clock. And thanks again uh, to Aishwarya, to Sean, and all the participants that have come on to this webinar today. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.